so began the game of moving the Queen around the chessboard of England. She had me sent to another gilded cage, Bolton Castle, which is in the middle of nowhere. My every move watched and reported upon. Oh, how carefully she thought she chose those with the keys. But she did not reckon on my allure. I found it good sport to wrap the men around my little finger and soon my jailer Francis Knollys became a good friend and a great tutor of English, as you may be able to tell. I was removed ever further from Scotland and yet closer to Elizabeth. They feared I meant to escape, so next, frightful Tutbury. Oh, how I hated the cold and draughty rooms there, not to mention the reek from the privies oh, and the damp. Oh, I do not like the damp. It makes my limbs ache so. Oh, and at Chartley, that moat. Why, I could barely walk whilst there. Despite my failing health, I was passed like a like a chestnut hot from the flame from one house to the next and the keys handed from one to the next. But always they watched. Some treated me with a dignity befitting my status, but some choose not to. They tried to unsettle and break me with this tactic. They thought I would crumble at the inconsistent existence, but I adapted. I recall one summer's day at Chartley when Paulette, my then jailer, arranged for me to accompany him on a stag hunt. It was uncharacteristically generous and I was suspicious, but no matter. I felt so free and it felt so good to have the sun on my face and the wind in my hair. I was right to be suspicious. Upon my return I was incandescent with rage. How dare they rifle through my possessions in my absence. That they found nothing should have proclaimed my innocent. So now a treason to my crime sheet. They had yet more letters. These, they said, implicated my desire to see Elizabeth dead. This was not so. I swear I would not see her harmed. They stripped me of my comforts, but let them take what they will. There are two things they cannot have, my royal blood and my faith. But I am getting ahead of myself. Life in captivity wasn't all bad. There were some good times. I, George Talbot, my most attentive and longest serving jailer, he and I were well suited. I empathised for his health was as poor as mine and I know he paid a heavy price to keep me. No, not just in coin, but by so oft being cut to the quick by the sharp tongue of that would-be queen shrew of a wife. I have many fond memories of my time with him. We had much in common. He shares my love of falconry and hunting, but at times the stags proved elusive, so oft we would ride far away from my prison walls, away from prying eyes at his Chatsworth estate. I did so love Chatsworth, although I felt most at peace in Buxton whilst taking the waters which oh, eased my aches and invigorated my whole being. That place felt the least like a prison. Dear Shrewsbury made it so that I visited almost every summer whilst under his care. 1570 was to bring some consistency in that I would spend the next 14 years being moved the short distance between Sheffield Manor Lodge, my main residence, and that wretched Sheffield Castle. But I also often spent days at beloved Wingfield Manor and, of course, Chatsworth. Oh yes, Shrewsbury afforded me such freedom as none others had, and I was grateful for it. Elizabeth Talbot, or Bess of Hardwick, was indeed a formidable force of nature. The second most powerful woman in the realm, George, her third husband. She had a knack of clawing her way up the hierarchy of England. Had there been a king on the English throne, Bess would have aimed to share it. While she came to resent me, we were at one time friends of sorts, having bonded over our love of embroidery, 
And yes, I had comforted them both in their grief of losing their son and heir, Francis, but celebrated with them the joy of grandchildren. Little Bessie, my goddaughter, and oh, adorable Arbella. My cousin Elizabeth had hoped that I'd perish in captivity, but I would not give her that satisfaction. Despite my ills, my steely core was undented. And that I was so well treated in Derbyshire, I fear contributed to the ever-diminishing funds made available, available to dear Shrewsbury. Of course, this caused problems in the Talbot marriage. But captive I was, and I hold my dear cousin responsible for my many afflictions. She has caused melancholy humours to be upon me, and at times, I admit, I have despaired. This, this pain in my side it ails me so, down to her. My look of freedom. No exercise caused my legs to forget their role, and for a time I suffered the indignity of being carried from room to room, down to her. The loss of my pretty young face, my luscious red hair, and my tiny waist, down to her. Yet despite this, I kept myself occupied, my ladies and I making merry with song and poetry and honing our embroidery skills, writing too until my hand ached, a prolific writer, mostly complaints and pleas to my cousin, but sonnets and poems I have penned too. But 19 years a prisoner for crimes I am falsely accused of. My friends, I confess I am guilty of poor judgment, of naivety, of trusting too easily. I was foolish, nay, arrogant to look to sit on the English throne. Yet a throne I have more right to than she who sits there now. Mark me though, I would never have wished harm to Elizabeth, though my final chapter makes a damning case. Anthony Babington had been a mere page when I first arrived at Wingfield Manor. I saw him often there and at Tutbury, and over the years we had become good friends. Just last year he brought me news of what I thought to be my salvation, but would alas be the downfall of us both. Yes, there had been plots aplenty. Catholic Europe had never quite abandoned my cause, but none well planned and and I would have no part in them. Signor Rodolfi had once almost cost me my head for a plot I had scant knowledge of and even less involvement, yet it had cost dear Norfolk his. This plan of Babington's, though, could just work. Spanish and papal agents had in mind to remove Elizabeth. I was to assume her throne and regain my birthright in Scotland, a united kingdom. Oh, it was a most enticing prospect, yet I was nervous and so pondered at length. Deciding it was now or never, I wrote in code giving this plot my sanction. Of course I had been tricked. Our correspondence transported in beer barrels had been intercepted and our cipher cracked. Spies, spies, spies! I envy her the loyalty of those around her. Elizabeth's eyes and ears are everywhere. This plot was doomed and I with it. I had forced her to do what she had put off for so long. She hastily arranged the trial, at which I was again forbidden defence and counsel. It would have but one outcome. I would not have given currency to it if there had been a hint at harming my cuz. I would neither condone nor sanction the execution of a fellow queen. It is not within me. And why risk losing the support of Catholic Europe? Giving the backlash over Henry Darnley's murder, how would they react to regicide? But I must not dwell on this. My suffering is drawing to a close. The hour draws close. I find myself here, 
at Fotheringhay Castle, so far from the place of my birth 44 years ago. Now, my friends, I am done with this world. No, do not weep, for I am most happy to leave. Instead, rejoice to see me martyred. I would just say to those who falsely accuse me, look to your conscience and remember that the theatre of the world is wider than the realm of England. Mary, Queen of the Scots, fears not the axe, for in my end is my beginning.